I don't have a formal speech prepared, but I have a lot of things to say about Billy Wilder because he's one of my heroes. And I wanted more than anything to interview him, but I was on the wrong coast. I was living in New York at the time uh, that I first harbored these feelings. And then one day I got an assignment from a magazine and they arranged a telephone interview with him. So that was my first contact with him. And the, the first surprise that I had was he wanted a list of the questions in advance, which I, I'd never done before. Uh, I like just sort of, you know, being spontaneous. And, and I thought, this is one of the sharpest wits of all time. Is he intimidated by having to answer, you know, extemporaneously? But I, I labored over 10 or, 10 or 11 questions that I would ask, and I sent them in, and he apparently found them acceptable. And then once we were talking, we could roam. I found very easily he was happy to roam around. Uh, I think it was maybe just a test or a rite of passage of some sort to see if I knew my stuff or if I was going to ask him dumb questions. And uh, we had a lovely chat. And then when my wife and I moved to L.A., we went to... Oh, uh, I was working for Entertainment Tonight. And the show, apparently, prior to my arrival there, had approached him for interviews on numerous occasions, and he always said no. Not just to us, but to any television interview. Why he was, again, gun-shy, uh, I cannot say. But he was. So, a short time after learning this, uh, we went to an evening at the Academy, the Motion Picture Academy, celebrating the great filmmaker Fred Zinnemann, who, like Wilder, was an Austrian emigre. And they had worked together very early on on a film in, uh, in Berlin called People on Sunday, uh, which had a lot of future filmmakers of note associated with it. So I, I, I went over to him to introduce myself, and uh, he said, this is Freddy's night, you know. I said, oh, I know, I'm very happy to... to have him and to meet him here, but I also had to pay my respects to you. I'm such an admirer. He said, well, that's very nice. He says, what do you do? I said, well, you should pardon the expression, I work in television. And he said, no, no, so long as you're working. <laughs> and of course, there was a kind of, you know, that, that, that was kind of an irony in that comment, because at that time, he was not in demand. Toward the end of his life, he still had ideas, concepts, even possibly finished screenplays, but was having trouble getting backing, getting financing to make the films he still wanted to make. Uh, so he meant it as a joke, but it's a sort of kidding on the square kind of joke. Uh, anyhow, I had another casual encounter or so with him, but it was just so exciting to be in his presence at all. One night the American Film Institute called me and said, would I be available a week from Monday to host a screening for their uh, associates, which is kind of their, their support group. They were going to be screening Some Like It Hot with Billy Wilder, Jack Lemmon, and Tony Curtis. And they asked me to moderate. I said, I think I'm free. <laughs> and I do have a picture of me with the three gentlemen. And we all had a, a dinner at a long table beforehand, you know. For a movie buff, this is just, this is it, this is Valhalla, uh, to have experiences like that. And he was, he was such an interesting man. On the one hand, he was known for being a cynic. Uh, I think he came by his cynicism honestly. He was born in Austria, moved to Berlin in the late 1920s when Berlin was a very hedonistic place to be. He got to work on his first movie there, as I say, mention on Sontag, People on Sunday, with all these future filmmakers, Kurt and Robert Siadmak. Robert Siadmak got the directing credit on the film. The cinematographer was a future cameraman of note named Eugen Shaftan. And his assistant was Fred Zinnemann, who later directed High Noon, you know, other classic films. So what a, an incredible conglomeration of talent. And Edgar G. Omer also worked on the film another later Hollywood uh, uh, director. 
And then, of course, the Nazis came to power. He fled. But his family did not. His brother did, W. Lee Wilder, who made B-movies mostly. But he lost his mother, his stepfather, and his grandmother in the Holocaust. Uh, hard to imagine, hard to put yourself in someone's place who's experienced that. I was reading up on him, and I didn't know that from his first marriage, which was in Europe, uh, he had two children, one of them a son who died in infancy. These, you know, these are life-altering experiences. Uh, they might make a cynic out of anybody. Of course, he found ways to channel that cynicism, most of them through humor, which is a great shield, you might say, uh, or armor against some of the slings and arrows one suffers in life. And uh, my friend Tony Slide is sitting here. Tony edited, as he may have already told you, the diaries of Wilder's longtime screenwriting and producing partner, Charles Brackett. And it, this is a revelatory book, uh, a wonderful, very immediate look at like a snapshot, day-by-day -day snapshot of what life was like working at a studio, preparing scripts, having battles with various producers or studio executives. But it turns out that Brackett and Wilder used to fight amongst themselves as well. They were hardly a harmonious couple. They were sometimes called that, but that was for a, the public pose. They had their own squabbles along the way. And, uh, but sometimes out of that kind of tension comes great art, or great results in any case. Wilder was under contract during the studio system, during the height of the Hollywood studio system. And when he saw that Preston Sturges, the brilliant screenwriter, took it upon himself to direct one of his own screenplays. And it wasn't an easy task to convince the Paramount chief to let him do that. Supposedly, Sturges sold them the screenplay for a dollar in return for getting the right to direct The Great McGinty in 1940. He was the first one to do that. Wilder was the second. Wilder followed in his footsteps. And he later said, as Sturges did, that he was tired of seeing his screenplays loused up by a director who didn't make the most of the opportunities there. And both he and Sturges uh, had films directed by Mitchell Lysen, who was a very talented, who had been an art director. But some people felt he never really went beyond the, the boundaries of being an art director and never became a very nuanced director. I, uh, we could argue that point, but we won't for tonight's purposes. But he wrote really good movies. He and Brackett wrote really good movies. And then he got to work with his hero, Ernst Lubitsch, one of the greatest directors who ever lived. Yet another emigre who came to Hollywood in the 20s during the silent film era. And Wilder just idolized Lubitsch and then got to work with him on a not very good film called Bluebeard's Eighth Wife and then a quite great film called Ninochka with Greta Garbo. And that to him was, that was the pinnacle getting to work with the great man himself. And when I was doing that interview with him on the phone, I complimented him on his movie from the 50s, Love in the Afternoon, with Audrey Hepburn and Gary Cooper. I said, you really caught the Lubitsch feeling there. And he said, well, he says, you can be like Lubitsch. You can aspire to being Lubitsch, but there was only one Lubitsch. So he sort of re refused the compliment. He would not, could not really compare himself to the, to the master, he felt. I, as an outsider, can do it for him, though. Uh, I think he did capture that, that spirit, that feeling. What's interesting in looking at the, the, the expanse of his filmography is how, first off, he always worked with collaborators. Always. And not just the, the famous ones, uh, Charles Brackett, who was his teammate for a number of years up through Sunset Boulevard, uh, and then later, I.A.L. Diamond, who wrote The Apartment and, uh, and 
almost every film there. There actually they worked on every film I think from the late 50s to his to his death. But they brought in other people as well, and almost everything he did was an adaptation of some existing work. A silent movie, an old play, a short story. Uh, the Apartment is one of their very few originals. <laughs> it happens to be a great one. But uh, I found that interesting. He, he seems to have sought out raw material that he could then mold and shape. And in much the way that in recent years, Quentin Tarantino, this is the only time you'll hear that name mentioned in Billy Wilder, perhaps in the same breath, but, but uh, I, I, I hope I'm not being irrelevant because Tarantino takes a lot of hits for copying or imitating films and filmmakers that he loves. He has encyclopedic knowledge of movies and television too. And I feel like saying to people, well, you try copying the films you love. See how well yours turn out. <laughs> it's not, you know, very glib to say, oh, it's just a, it's just a, a mashup of you know, other people's movies. Well, maybe it is. But it's then funneled through someone else's sensitivity and someone else's abilities. And for Wilder, it was the same. The first film he directed from his own screenplay, with bracket, was The Major and the Minor, a very cute film with Ginger Rogers and Ray Milland. But it was based on a, on a play, an earlier play and short story. When he got done with it, it had the Wilder touch, just as Lubitsch had his touch. His second film, Five Graves to Cairo, a very underrated film with Eric von Stroheim, French Alton, and Baxter, very good World War II uh, movie set in Northern Africa, was a remake of a silent film, a Paramount silent picture. Very different from the silent because it was Wilder shaped it to his own liking. And so it was over the years. When he received the AFI Life Achievement Award in the mid-80s, part of the deal of getting this honor was that you agreed to go to the AFI and uh, to do a question and answer session with the filmmaking students. They used to call them fellows at the AFI because it was a conservatory. And he talked very freely with them about anything they wanted to ask. And then one young woman said, I don't understand. You say you made two or three films a year. How did you make your deals? When did you make your deals? He said, we didn't make deals. We were under contract. They paid us 52 weeks a year. We went from one film to the next. And that was a concept that was foreign to that young lady because it's foreign to everybody now. There's no such system in operation. But imagine having that freedom, having that ability. I mean, there were a lot of negatives to the studio system and you know, people, have compla people complained then, people complain in retrospect. But the benefit it had was you had a home. You had a kind of cocoon. It was a, some people would say it was a, a a jail with velvet on the iron bars. Uh, you know, a very comfortable prison. Nevertheless, if you had the gumption, and he did, and the determination, and he did, you could surmount some of the obstacles of that studio system and, and its hierarchy and make films that were very personal, topical, provocative, that even went against the grain. When he made The Lost Weekend, he and Charles Brackett made The Lost Weekend in 1945, no one had ever, which of course was based on a novel by a man named Charles Jackson, no one had ever done a serious study of alcoholism, a subject of a Hollywood movie before. Drunks were usually comedy uh, props, they were good for a laugh, a stumbling drunk. A serious, even harrowing look at alcoholism, unheard of and seemingly uncommercial. But he managed to get that film made. Bracket co-writing, bracket producing, he directing and co-writing. Won Ray Milland and the Academy Award, they all took home awards. And it became a success, 
as a result because it was so potent and so so honest uh, a level of honesty that people hadn't seen before from a mainstream Hollywood movie. So he did this over and over again. It didn't always work. He made one film in 1951 that is now considered a great film, but was a terrible flop at the time, and it's called Ace in the Hole. And some of you may have seen it with Kirk Douglas and Jan Sterling. And it was inspired by a real life incident about a man trapped in a mine and it turning into a media circus, what today we would call a media circus. Well, that phenomenon is not new. It wasn't new. The, the real incident with a man named Floyd Collins took place in 1925, so it wasn't even new then. When he made this film in 1950, television was still new-ish. It, it existed. People had sets. It was still growing. But the film about human nature and about a uh, hard-bitten reporter who thinks only of himself and his own glory was rejected by the early audiences who saw it. So Paramount, without telling Wilder, when they sent it out into wider release, retitled it The Big Carnival in a kind of blatant effort to mislead the public to thinking they were going to get something they weren't going to get. And every time Hollywood does that, right to this day, and they do it all the time, like selling a drama as a comedy in the trailer, you've all seen that. You know, you see movies where they take only the few humorous moments in a film and get, try to, you know, steer you into believing it's a comedy. Somehow the aroma seeps through the screen, and people are very seldom fooled. So the big carnival didn't do any business either. That, that title didn't help at all. And, and it helped lead to his disaffection with Paramount. The, but we live in more cynical times now, for better or worse. And people now hold that up as one of his best films. Funny how time can change your outlook on certain things. And it is a great film. Revisited it pretty recently. It's awfully good and it seems as fresh as if it was made yesterday. Wilder had his, being from Vienna, Austria, he had a schmaltzy side too. It occasionally rose to the fore, once with spectacular lack of success when he made a, a musical with Bing Crosby called Emperor Waltz, possibly his worst Hollywood movie, which he, that's his, his opinion too. Uh, Bing Crosby was a big, big star. Wilder was a big, now proven success as a director, but things just didn't gel on that movie. And occasionally, it, he would call on those, those elements again, not, not too often. Uh, he tried to make a light romantic comedy out of Sabrina with the, the wonderful Audrey Hepburn and I think a badly miscast Humphrey Bogart and a barely tolerable William Holden who's an actor I love I just think they were all wrong for the roles but the film you know with that star power couldn't really fail at the box office but it's, again it's, it's Wilder I think following his his instincts to a certain degree to do something a little schmaltzy, a little romantic, a little uncynical with mixed results. But then he did Love in the Afternoon, which hit everything just right, just right, the right balance of ingredients. And that balance is, when it works, is glorious. He took a lot of criticism for using suicide as a plot element in the apartment. And some people took great offense at this, saying, how can you have a so-called comedy with you know, a woman so despondent she tries to kill herself? Well, it's not just a comedy, of course. It's, it's a social satire. It's a drama. 
It's, it's a mixture of things. Why does everything have to have a label? The Apartment is a unique movie, and it does run the gamut of emotions. And I think it's because he had such a firm grasp of all those elements that it works so well. And of course, Jack Lemmon and Shirley MacLaine were just magic together on screen with the added bonus of Fred McMurray. Now again, following instincts. Fred McMurray, who always, almost always played clean cut, wholesome, light comedy leads, you know, light dramatic leads, occasional westerns. The year, the year 1944, when Wilder cast him in Double Indemnity, McMurray had never played a heel. Never. And, it, and he's perfect. He's perfect in that film. That badinage between him and Stanwyck, it's great dialogue, but not everybody could deliver it the way he and Stanwyck do. And then 16 years later, he cast him again as a heel in the apartment. But this was a year after McMurray made the shaggy dog for Walt Disney. <laughs> And it's the year he started appearing on television every week in My Three Sons. So again, it was a gamble. It was a gamble he took, but it was a calculated gamble. Because he knew McMurray had it in him to give that performance. And he did. His biggest misstep in the years that followed, there were several, was making a film called Kiss Me Stupid in 1964. And it starred Dean Martin and Ray Walston and Kim Novak. And this film wasn't just a flop. It wasn't just a failure. It was reviled. <laughs> I mean, people not only, people just, people in the industry hated it. Moviegoers, well, most of them didn't go, but those who went didn't like it. It was called vulgar. Imagine we're 19. We're in the year 2018. Consider what we think of as vulgar today. And this film seems, you know, childish in comparison. But it involved adultery, and it involved, uh, again, a level of cynicism that people were not uh, ready to embrace. And Wilder became something of a pariah because of this movie in Hollywood gave an interview to the New York Times some months later and said that he, he felt he had to get busy and make another movie that people liked so he could get back on the Godfathers and Pallbearers lists. <laughs> and ultimately he did. He, he, he made a film called The Fortune Cookie that he and I.L. Diamond wrote that made a star out of Walter Matthau and earned him an Academy Award as Best Supporting Actor. Which is, a, which is also ludicrous because he's the star of the movie. He's, he's supporting no one. He and Jack Lemmon are in the movie together. I think I have never measured, but I dare say he has more footage, more screen time than Lemmon in this particular film because Lemmon plays a guy who's hospitalized after an accident early in the film. But Matthau is just perfection. It was Wilder who saw that. And, and Matthau was not a newcomer. He'd been making films since the early 50s. But again, Wilder saw something there. So he had very good instincts and very good ideas, but he wasn't foolproof. He wasn't invulnerable. Uh, he made mistakes. He made missteps. And the problem was, as the 60s wore on and into the 70s, that the studio system collapsed entirely. He was fortunate to have loyal backing of uh, the Mirsch Brothers, a company called the Mirsch Company, which produced most of his films. And they stuck with him a long, long time, through thick and thin. And there, there were several flops during that, that tenure. Not the least being Kiss Me Stupid. And then I, I, I sensed there was a kind of almost a desperation on his part to regain what he had lost. So he and Diamond decided to do a remake of the front page, 
with Lemon and Matthew. Because Lemon and Matthew had now become sort of a de facto comedy team. I mean, they, were, they were both superb actors who didn't need to, you know, rest on that reputation. But they were never going to say no to, to Billy Wilder. And if he wanted to redo the Hector MacArthur play the front page yet again, they would go along for the ride. And it's a competent film, but it's not an inspired film. And for once, I think in this case, he took material that didn't need improving. That was great just the way it was. And, and in fact, if anything, he weakened it by trying to modernize some of the, some of the dialogue, even though they kept it as a period piece. Then he made a film that was from the heart, with Jack Lemmon, called Avanti. And if you've never seen this one with Jack Lemmon and Juliet Mills, it's, it's very obscure. It's available. It's on DVD. I think it's available for streaming. It's a romantic comedy drama set in Italy. And I think, I think it's wonderful. I seem to be somewhat alone. Not completely alone. Other people like this movie. So the one I'm alone on is his last movie, Buddy Buddy, which yet again teamed Lemon and Mathau, which I saw when it came out in 1985. I said, why are people ripping this to shreds? It's, it's a funny movie. I am alone. I'm the only one who seems to like that movie. I have not, I have not had the, the guts, I will confess, to see it again. Because <laughs> I don't want to prove myself wrong. <laughs> And, I, and usually I trust my first impression. I don't often go back you know, to, to see if I, if I feel the same way. Someday I'm going to have to give that a try, put, the, put that to the litmus test. But it was a failure, and that was his last failure. He couldn't afford another one. I've always felt how bad could things be that you wouldn't give Billy Wilder an opportunity to try something else. But he lived a good many years inactive. Now, he was still active. He, still, he had an office space. He and Diamond had an office in Beverly Hills where they showed up together, I think every day, and tried to do some work. Of course, he was besieged with requests for interviews, and he granted some. But he, he wanted so badly to be active again as a filmmaker. And here, all these young people would come along and get their shot, as they should. Every, every generation comes along and has to renew the, you know, the, the, uh, the system and bring your new ideas to the table. That's as it should be. But does that mean we sweep the old veterans out with the, with the, with the trash? I, I, you know, I, I would like to think not, but Hollywood is noted for its ageism. That's why I was so pleased to see James Ivory, 89-year-old James Ivory, get an Academy Award this year. Like, okay, there's still hope. Uh, I, uh, I wish Wilder had gotten more opportunities in his later years. The one thing he did do is he allowed one young filmmaker that he took a shine to, Cameron Crowe, to do a lengthy series of inter interviews with him, which became a book called Conversations with Wilder. If you're interested in him, it's a book you, you want to look at. Now again, everything is from the old man's perspective. So he contradicts some things that he had said in earlier years. Some stories come out a little differently. This is, this is life. This is human nature. This is the way things go. So you can't, not everything is said in cement. But it's very revealing. And I think pretty candid. He was also part of the resettlement operation and uh, was in Germany when the camps were liberated in 1945. He, he saw some of that. Can you imagine? I can't. Uh, but as I say, humor was his, his armor. And he managed to tell his truths through humor and express his point of view through humor. And that is a great gift. And that perhaps is, was the greatest gift of all a gift that keeps on giving as we revisit his films, which I hope to do the rest of my life. 
And it's so wonderful that you here at Hillsdale do these, these symposia where you actually screen the films, not on a TV set, and, and have an audience, a live audience, because that is the way they were meant to be seen. Not alone or on an iPhone, even alone in your room with a, with a decent sized television set. They were meant for an audience. They were meant to be seen a little larger than life, sometimes a lot larger than life. And that's how they were designed. So to see them in any lesser form is to lessen their impact. Now we all get lazy and we all get used to our ways. I watch films on t TV too, you know. Uh, and uh, I s download and I watch DVDs. I mean, it's too convenient not to. But if you ever have an opportunity, you should seize it because that's how you're going to really appreciate the film to its fullest. How many of you saw The Apartment today? Good. I'm so glad you took that opportunity because, again, they don't happen often enough, those chances. And I want to open things up to, to you to ask what you want to talk about. And uh, do we have a second microphone for, for the audience? They're working on that. Okay. Well, in the meantime, what we'll do is we'll, I'll just repeat anything you want to ask so that everyone knows what question I'm answering, if I can answer it for you. Don't all rush forward at once. <laughs> on the aisle there, sir. Now, we'll all be able to hear you clearly. Just hang on one second. You're talking about how much you like one, two, three, which shows you have excellent taste. Well, I certainly think so. I certainly think so. Um, it was a uh, James Cagney's last major role. He didn't right. appear in uh, Ragtime, Rag mm -hmm. but it was a small part. But he was just a dynamo in that movie, and I'm so glad that Billy Wilder made the movies uh, so that you know James Cagney is getting a little little older, but he's just still had that oh, rhythm. Oh man, that rat tat tat, yeah. uh, spewing out that dialogue uh, with such vigor. It's it's hilarious. It's a hilarious movie, a wonderful, it's a farce. And, a wonderful, and again, a topical farce set in what was then West Germany, when Berlin was divided, when Germany was divided and Berlin was divided. And one of the things I like best about it is uh, Andre Previn's score, because he uses uh, Aram Khachaturian's saber dance as the main recurring theme through the movie. I got to compliment Mr. Previn about that once. He thanked me in return, so that was, that was nice. Great, great choice. Yes, one, two, three. Well worth seeing again. See, but if you see it with people who are laughing with you, it gets even funnier. Don't be shy, folks. <laughs> yes. You, sir. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed, to I'm, I'm supposed to follow my directions here. Who of today's um, directors, writers, uh, would you compare that have the same standard and consistent um, look at, at, at their films in a way that Wilder um, uh, did his films? Well, the first name that comes to mind, not the only, but the first name is Alexander Payne, who uh, just had a film come out that, that was considered a failure that, again, I was in the minority I like, called Downsizing. But this is the man who made Citizen Ruth and Election and About Schmidt and Nebraska and Sideways. Uh, he is a writer-director. Sometimes he writes alone, sometimes a longtime partner, Jim Taylor. He's a social satirist. And he makes his own films. Oh, The, the Descendants with George Clooney, another wonderful film. Uh, he works slowly, carefully, and makes his own films on his own terms. And I admire him endlessly. And uh, so he's the only one that comes right to mind as someone who might be in the same league as Billy Wilder, as, as a complete filmmaker. So we've seen four of his films now so far. And I'm wondering if you have um, any particular unifying elements that you would say are, are um, staples of, of his directing and his, and his writing. Unifying elements. Well, uh, again, the, the wit, the sharpness of dialogue, 
the um, the irreverence, uh, and sometimes cloaked, barely cloaked, uh, a topical point of view. Whether it's uh, in a film about American commercialism coming to West Germany during the Cold War, or West Berlin recovering from World War II in a foreign affair, or evoking the 1920s and some like it hot, uh, the dark side of the 1920s with gangsterism. Uh, I, I, you know, but this is also a man who made the, the, the Lindbergh story, The Spirit of St. Louis. You know, and uh, adapted and sanitized somewhat uh, the Broadway hit The Seven Year Itch as a vehicle for Marilyn Monroe. Uh, so he, you know, he was not a one note filmmaker. Uh, he tackled, and of course, he did the ultimate film noir, Double Indemnity. So uh, I, I think the only unifying factor is quality. Yes, sir. When it seemed like when Gene Wa or when Wilder went over and became a director as well as a writer, he had much more control over the look of his films, and I saw that especially uh, in Dublin Indemnity. But even with the Mirish group, he then hit, you know they had more production control and things like that. I was really surprised in this film; it really threw me off that it was in black and white. It was beautiful. But well, he shot it widescreen, and he had been such a master of composing his scenes. It seemed like it, I felt uneasy with it. Did you really? I um, all all I think about is that incredible shot of the insurance office, those endless rows of desks, and that's his great art director, Alexander Trauner, another emigre, emigre. Uh, who uh, had worked in Europe for many years and brought his touch to, to Wilder. Uh, you know, he was, he was not a visualist. That was not his strong suit. Uh, I think he saw camera work as means to an end. You know, the, the idea was to tell the story as clearly and as evocatively as possible. And... Uh, much like his contemporary Joseph L. Mankiewicz, who was primarily a writer, who also directed, and who, you know, uh, who d didn't necessarily think in, in terms of, of visual ideas, but ideas themselves and how best to express them. So I, 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 I'm sorry you didn't, you didn't think he had a good handle on, uh, on the widescreen. Uh, again, I think of the, the closing shot of uh, Lemon and McLean uh, sitting in the apartment, you know, dealing the cards. I think that has impact in a widescreen frame. So I, you know, uh, I didn't watch it again today, so I don't have a fresh uh, a view in my head, but uh, I don't recall ever feeling uncomfortable with it. By the way, his, his, his love of punchlines is something he shared with Mankiewicz. They both loved having a great finish, and they really were upset. And this takes some explaining. When long credit rolls started becoming the norm in Hollywood movies, you notice that at the end of the apartment, when she says "shut up and deal," and it says "the end," you know, a Mirish film released by United Artists, it's over. That's what you take with you as you walk out into the lobby, into your car, into your home. It lingers. Well, nobody's perfect. That's what you take with you. The, and then, it, then it, it, with a, a musical uh, signature, dum, dum, the end. That's how some like it hot ends. That's what you take with you. Not assistant pencil sharpener, <laughs> driver, gaffers. Now, again, I don't mean any disrespect to the crews of these movies. I mean no disrespect to them at all. But it was just not how they operated then. And both Wilder and Mankiewicz felt that those wonderful finales that they devised were diluted. 
after those credit rolls became, became de rigueur. ever had a sense of self-irony regarding um, the, the problem of diminishing career uh, relative to the um, Sunset at Boulevard, uh, Sunset Boulevard film? Well, he made another film that was not successful called Fedora about a producer trying to coax uh, uh, an actress, an older actress, out of retirement. And William Holden played the producer. And, uh, and the German actress Martha Keller played the actress. And uh, it was based on a novella by Tom Tryon. And it was not that good a film. And it had a lot of barbs about current filmmaking in it, which might have been more successful if the film itself had been a better movie. Uh, and I was right around the time I interviewed him and I asked him if he saw it as a, a sort of a sequel to Sunset Boulevard. And he, he brushed that off and then he said, well, if you want to call it Sunset Boulevard 2, that's okay. Uh, yes, I think he had a keen self-awareness. And uh, he knew where he stood. And he, you know, he, I don't think he saw himself as Norma Desmond because he didn't live in the past. He was not locked into the past. He was aware of current affairs. When he won the AFI, what, what, not won, when he was given the AFI Life Achievement Award, uh, he was interviewed uh, on the red carpet going in, and he said, well, I guess all I have now to look forward to is the Heisman Trophy. <laughs> so, you know, he was, he was sharp. He was very sharp, and he, he got the whole picture. Well, I'm with you on Avanti, you're alone on Buddy Buddy. Um, okay. okay. C'est la vie. I would I'd like you to talk about a film I don't think any of us speakers mentioned this week, which is his Sherlock Holmes. The Private was, Life of Sherlock Holmes. Right, which was taken away from him. And Will we ever have an opportunity to see his version, or is that lost forever? I think the conclusion is, and a number of people, he made a film called The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. He shot it in London with Robert Stevens in the leading role, and a very good British cast, and it was taken out of his control, and at one point, I forget who it was, was spearheading an effort to find the, 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 the some of the footage does exist apparently in various vaults, but not enough to piece it back together as he envisioned it. And all he said was, uh, this is a film buff joke, but he said, don't expect another greed, referring to Eric von Stroheim's silent film, which was taken out of his hands and uh, was often thought of as the, the ultimate lost masterpiece. But I, I don't think, uh, apparently, we may see other fragments, but not, not the whole as we would like to. There's a hand back there and another hand here. Yes, Mr. Malt, I consider you a national treasure, so thank you so much for being here. Well, flattery will get you everywhere. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, you mentioned some. It, it, I was wondering, you mentioned the interminable uh, uh, ending you know, post, you know, the roles at the end where they talk about the caterer and the animal trainer and all of that was, of course, with Hollywood and usually it's a business decision. Why was that done? Was that union contract, union rules, or do you know the, the reason why now we have these it, it evolved. ending roles? It evolved. I mean, the, the other extreme was not really satisfactory either because in the early days, if you look at an early 30s movie, you can fit the entire crew on one, one card or two cards at most. And, but then what happened in those cases is that often just the department head, the head of the costume department got credit and not the people who really designed the costumes for that particular film or the head of the art department or the head of the sound department. So that was, you know, that's not really playing fair either and it's denying credit to people who really contributed to the films. 
but then, now we have the other extreme. There was a midway point at a certain moment in the late 60s, early 70s when the crawl started to happen, and then everybody wanted their piece of the pie. And I don't think it was a union thing. I think it was uh, just, you know, storming the barricades and saying, you know, it's about time we got credit. And not everybody, it's still, uh, what, what's funny is I'll talk to somebody and say, well, I didn't get credit for that. They left someone out? Those <laughs> credits run for days. Who gets left out? Yes. I read online that Wilder considered The Apartment to be his best film. Can you explain why? Well, first, I'm sure he took pride in that it was original piece of work, not an adaptation of an existing piece that he and Diamond, you know, uh, concocted together. I'm sure that's part of it. It, uh, it was very successful. It was an Academy Award winner, so it had popular approval as well as prestige and critical approval. Uh, I think it was just, you know, a film that succeeded it on every level. And uh, that's that, mean, and, and and of course it also transcends genres with comedy and drama, and uh, and as I say, social satire thrown in. So uh, I, w I would assume those were the reasons. By the way, the the theme, the musical theme, which became a hit record at the time, by the piano duo Ferrante and Teicher, was not original to the film. And that person didn't get credit. It, that, seriously, Adolf Deutsch gets music credit, sole music credit, but it was taken from a British film of the late 40s. And I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember the name of the film. But that was an existing piece of music that they, that they, they licensed. Thank you. Thank you very much, folks. I really appreciate your attention. Thank you very, very much.